Hello, today we're gonna to be discussing meniscal repair in a recent biomechanical study published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. We have with us in the studio, Dr. Aaron Critch from Rochester, Minnesota, Dr. Travis Mack from Salt Lake City, Utah, and Dr. Pat Smith from Columbia, Missouri. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Chris. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. So gentlemen, let's start by talking about meniscal pathology in general. Pat, what is repairable or potentially not repairable with present day techniques? Well, Chris, as a knee surgeon, I think our goal is to always repair the meniscus. And now we have the techniques available to do great intra-articular repairs all inside. Plus, we also can do side-to-side -side repairs, such as with the knee scorpion. So I think the devices have really helped us expand what we can repair. Now, Aaron, you've helped lead the charge for meniscal preservation. Why such a strong focus on this lately? Well, the meniscus is just critical to the overall health of the knee and knee function. And we know if we remove meniscus tissue, it's really the beginning of the end. And as Pat uh, stated very well, we have more techniques, we're saving more meniscal tissue, which will lead to better outcomes. So once we've decided the meniscus can be repaired, we consider the ABCs, anatomic reduction, biologic preparation, and compression. Travis, what are your anatomic considerations? So for me, the most important thing is reestablishing the biomechanical integrity of the meniscus. Circumferential fibers, uh, if compromised, for example, with a radial tear, need to be restored. Pat mentioned the meniscal scorpion, a great option for that. Uh, root repairs as well, establishing the attachment to the tibia. And last but not least, the circumferential, when torn in a vertical fashion, uh, reestablishing the repair to the capsule and minimizing any sort of displacement is also increasingly important. Good points, Travis. Now, Aaron, how are you preparing the meniscus to elicit a biologic response? Yeah, that B for biology is extremely important. And as a surgeon, we certainly don't want to overlook that step of the meniscus repair operation. So we really need to spend a lot of time rasping, not only the repair site, the surface of the meniscus, the synovial uh, area around the meniscus. We're learning more recently that a lot of progenitor cells live in those areas, and we really want to stimulate those cells to begin the healing cascade. Aaron, are you doing anything else biologically, like trephination or anything else to, to stimulate that healing process with your repairs? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so certainly if tears are extending into the avascular zones, then trephination I think is a great option. Anytime you have an isolated meniscus repair without a ligament reconstruction, I think doing some marrow venting, stimulating the notch bone, I think it can be very helpful. Thanks, Aaron. That's definitely an important step. Pat, now that the meniscus is ready to be repaired, let's talk about stitch configuration and tissue compression. Well, I think tissue compression, Chris, is critical for healing. And we know the vertical mattress suture is the strongest construct. But I think it's important to understand the anatomy of the meniscus in its triangular shape. So if you put a vertical mattress just on top, you could actually separate underneath the meniscus. So I think it's critical to put a divergent vertical mattress above the meniscus and then come underneath the meniscus and put another vertical mattress divergent there to close that gap to make sure you have full compression at the tear site. Okay, so Pat, you and Aaron were co-authors on this paper. What influenced you both to put this type of biomechanical study together? Well, I know from talking to Aaron, because we both were able to get the fiber stitch in our hands very early on, how excited we were to have an adjustable, tensionable device for meniscal repair, which hasn't been out there. So we wanted to compare that to what the gold standard of today was in terms of other devices for meniscal repair. Okay, now there have been publications in the past that have compared all inside meniscus repair to inside out repairs. Pat, why is this study unique? Well, I think the uniqueness is what we looked at because we, other studies are really concentrating on gap formation or maybe ultimate load of repairs. We actually looked at the strength of the device uh, and compared that uh, to, to really show how it can help gap formation based on the, the quality of the, of the fixation initially to optimize compression for healing. That's great, thanks Pat. So Travis, can you dive into the methodology of the publication for us? Absolutely, so the, this specific study looked at three peak all inside implants, as well as the fiber stitch, a suture, all suture based all inside technique, as well as two inside out techniques using standard suture and then suture tape. And really it looked at both cyclic loading with 500 cycles, as well as initial displacement and pull out strength. Uh, and looked at which of the anchors and which techniques were better, worse, which had a better myomechanical parameters, which had worse. Travis, that was a great summary and uh, a great discussion, gentlemen. Thank you uh, once again for joining us in the studio today. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Absolutely. So this has been a great discussion on the importance of meniscal preservation and the impact of this AGSM biomechanical study. If you haven't had a chance, we encourage you to watch our other episode where we break down the results of the publication and highlight how the paradigm is shifting to all inside meniscal repair with all suture fixation. Thank you for joining us.